to turn this morning to verses 9 and 10 in John chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. My subject this morning then is abiding love. It's simple and straightforward. It fits into what we studied last week on Jesus being the vine. I don't know if you read the local newspaper, but apparently there is a vineyard in Rydale. I hadn't realised there was one, and it's not very far from us. And the reason it was in the news this last week is it's won a bronze award for its wine. It must be quite remarkable stuff. If you're interested, go down to Whitwell on the hill, and instead of going down the hill, turn left. If you're going towards York, it's down there somewhere, Rydale Vineyard. Who would have believed it? But of course, the purpose of a vineyard is to grow fruit. And that fruit is to have a good purpose. The principle is well established in verses 1 through 8. And then what you have in the next part of the chapter is the Lord, in fact, describing three forms of the fruit that's to be visible in our lives. Most folks know Galatians 5.22, and even as I say it, you're probably rehearsing it in your mind. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. In actual fact, as I'll seek to show you in the next few weeks, they're right here in this text. As Paul said to the Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love. As Jesus says to his disciples, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And that, dear friends, is where I want to go this morning if God will give us the help. Because that's the purpose of being a believer. It's to come and abide in his love. And I would suggest to you that that's the power or the dynamic which equips us to live as believers in a very complicated and troublesome world. So I want to look at three things about abiding in his love. The first one is the pattern of abiding. Secondly, the principle of abiding. And thirdly, the practice of abiding. The pattern of abiding is in the relationship between the Father and the Son at the beginning of verse 9. You know, one of the privileges of being a preacher is it forces you to study the Scriptures. I enjoy reading them, but studying them brings a whole different framework into your mind and into your presence. And I must admit, when I came to this, I just gasped. It's an amazing statement. It's an incredible part of the Bible. When it describes this great pattern of abiding that has been in existence from eternity. We are to abide in the Father's love as Christ abides in the Father's love. You'll see it at the end of verse 10. And the picture of abiding in the Father's love is there in verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. In their eternal union, if you would, there is the practice and the existence of love. We're very familiar, I hope, with the two phrases from 1 John which tell us God is love. And it's a wonderful text. But here is a picture of that love at work. The Father loved me, I also loved you. The Father was loving the Son in eternity. Because that's who God is. God is holy, God is righteous, God is just. These are all attributes of God, not parts of God, characteristics of God. And at the heart of them is this principle that God is also love. It's a core aspect of God's character, said one of my books. His person. It's in no sense in conflict with his holiness, or his righteousness, or his justice, or even his wrath. It says all of God's attributes are in perfect harmony. Everything God does is loving. Just as everything he does is just and right. God is the perfect example of true love. And the object of his love from all eternity has been the Son. As the Father loved me. Let that sink in just for a moment. God didn't make us because he needed somebody to love. 
God already loves in eternity. I hope it's stretching your imagination. It does mine. To use modern language, it blows my mind. And it's not something I should therefore just sort of nod and say, yes, it's in the book, I believe it. Allow it to permeate your existence. That there was and always has been, as John 17, 24, a relationship in which, as Jesus says, you loved me before the foundation of the world. So he's not loving him because he's come to earth. He's always loved him. There's always been that principle. There's always been that personal interaction between the members of the Trinity. It never began at any point. It's who he is. As the Father loved me. Remember, he confirmed that when Jesus was baptized. This is my well-beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Or on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter and his enthusiasm wanted to build booths for everybody, they vanished, and this is my well-beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We need to draw this as a principle, because it's going to have an impact on how we see ourselves in God's sight. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. Of course you've read that. But the Greek scholars tell me that when it says the word was with God, you can translate that phrase as face to face with God. They were in such close, intimate relationships. I sometimes think about it this way. You think about even the person you love most. How long can you look them directly in the face? You might do it for a minute or two and tell them, I hope you do from time to time, how precious they are to you. But we find it very hard to be in constant eye-to-eye contact within the Trinity. That was the state from eternity. There was nothing hidden, nothing unlovely about them. They were in such perfect harmony. And the Lord Jesus tells us this so that you and I might understand how much we are loved. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. I also have loved you. The psychologists tell us understanding that your love is basic to being a, a sane, stable person. And yet we find in our world so many people grow up wondering whether they are loved, finding from their circumstances <coughs> difficulties intruding into their lives which may in fact harm them and distort them as they grow up. Here's a truth which... which is greater than all of those, even if you've grown up in the worst family in the world. If you're a child of God, Jesus says, I also have loved you, just as the Father has loved me. I also have loved you. This, says Jesus, is how much I love my followers. And remember, we are here just leaving the upper room. Chapter 14 ended with them getting up from the feast and the Lord Jesus is walking into the Garden of Gethsemane where he's about to be arrested because one of the twelve has betrayed him. And in a few short hours, all of them will run for their lives. Peter will deny him because a little girl asks him too personal a question. And here the Lord lays down a very firm foundation. He's not loving them on the basis of their performance. He's not loving them because of their potential. He loves them because they're his. You did not choose me. Did you see it in verse 16? But I chose you. He's loving them because they've been given to him from all eternity. And this theme is to be understood as being foundational to our Christian faith. You find other little snippets of it, don't you? (coughs) <coughs> in Ephesians 5.25 Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her not the building, not the bricks but the people in your seats Christ loved the church he didn't come to love the church I'm married to a very wonderful lady she's not here so I can say it but there was a time when I didn't love her because I'd never met her But in God's providence, these things came about. And now, dear friends, I wouldn't be without her. That's love, isn't it? But Christ has set his love upon us. He has declared his love for us. 
and he has done that from eternity. A.W. Pink quotes John Gill like this. He says, As the Father loved him from everlasting, so did he love them. As the Father loved him with a love of delight, so did he love them. As the Father loved him with a special and peculiar affection, with an unchanging, invariable, constant love which would last forever, in like manner does Christ love his people. And with this he enforces the exhortation which follows. In like manner does Christ love his people. It's eternal. It's immutable, it's constant, it's unchanging. And it's the reason that the Saviour will go to Calvary. But he recognises how unlovely these people are. And that he, if they are ever to be with him in glory, then their sin must be dealt with. And so he steadfastly moves on toward Calvary. In reflection, the disciples realise this. At the beginning of chapter 13, you have this verse. Uh, which is put in by John, he says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. God so loved the world, he sent his only son. God the Son demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. Unlovely, Christ died for us. On that very special night, this is the message that he wants to penetrate the mind and the thinking of his people. And it is the powerful truth that will equip them to become the world changers that they did become. We have a God whose love is beyond telling, beyond comprehension. We've sung about it in every hymn we've sung so far this morning. We've rehearsed it because we need to remember it. Paul writes at the end of Romans 8, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall separate us from... Can you finish it? The love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the pattern. That's where love is to be in our life. That's how we are to find our worth. That's how we are to know our significance. That's where we are to go for our comfort. That's the energizing power that makes us the people of God that we are. And I would suggest to you that if you're not living close to God, it's because you've forgotten how much you're loved. And there's a sense to which you cannot get too close to God because you need to know the power of his love in your life. That our God is a God who gives. Gives himself. Gives eternal life. Gives everlasting hope. And having given himself on the cross, he has opened the door of salvation to bring us into the kingdom of God. There's an old Illustration. I've seen it in many books and sermons, so you might have heard it before. I do believe it was traced back to Mr. Spurgeon at one time about a, a farmer who had a weather vane on his barn and inscribed on the arrow were the words, God is love. And somebody cheekily said to them, what do you mean by that? Do you think that God's love is changeable? And the farmer was quick to answer, oh no, I mean that whatever way the wind blows, God is love. Whatever way the wind blows, Whatever's going on in my life, whatever other complication is screwing me up, if I might use that language, there's one thing that is constant, steady, unchanged, never has been changed, has never depended on you. It's always been his attitude toward us, towards us. <coughs> Having said all that, the Saviour then says, Abide in my love. Abide in my love. <coughs> Remember last week I told you this word abide is quite... Quite, quite helpful. It means to set up home. Put down roots. Stay in. Continue. Resonate, reside. 
I found another definition this week. Endure without yielding. Just put yourself here and keep yourself here because this is God's refuge for the storms of life. This is God's refuge when the world seems to fall in about your ears. And it's going to. Within 24 hours, these very disciples are going to think the end of the world has come. Or the end of their world has come. The Lord Jesus is equipping them. And as they were equipped, you and I are to be equipped. We are to abide once and for all. If you could read the Greek, you would see from the, 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 the verb used that this is to be something which is constant, which is to be deliberate, and is a command. It's to continue. The authorised version actually uses that word, doesn't it? Continue in my love. The NIV says, remain in my love. And they're all wrestling to get this thought into our minds. What does it mean to abide in me? It means to live in a, a daily personal relationship with Jesus. And that will show itself in that we trust him when we can't see the end from the beginning. That we believe him when his word tells us how to live and what to do. It will show in our prayer life. We'll talk with him about everything that's going on as well as the things that he wishes to see going on. It will result in obedience. And it will fill us with joy. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, verse 11. And that your joy may be full. I'm looking forward to preaching on that next week. That my joy may remain in you. I think the great tragedy of the church is we are just, we are, we are not, we're not giving good evidence of the joy. And I say that to our own congregation. We studied a book in the Bible study last year which was all about um, Jesus as a man of joy. And I rebuked myself because I read it and agreed with it and I'm saying, where is it? But I'll not run ahead to next week. In the meantime, the, 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 the principle, the, the thing behind the power for that joy is abiding in Christ's love. <coughs> it's knowing that he is for you no matter who is against you and I in you abide in my love that will mean that God's word will become to us very precious it will become to us the love letter from heaven so that we'll not simply be reading it to pass exams or to preach sermons or to educate ourselves we'll be asking all the time about how this tells us of God's great kindness towards us. J.C. Ryle says, it means continue resting your souls on this love of mine towards you and live under a constant sense of it. Remain clinging to it as within a fortress and a place of refuge. Christ's free and continued and mighty love should be the home and abiding place of a believer's soul. Okay, we've got the theory. Here's the principle. It's putting it into practice that's going to take us the rest of our existence. And I'm really glad to tell you that it's quite clear that the early church knew this principle but had trouble putting it into practice. And so you find Jude writing to the church which is being undermined by people bringing in error. Jude chapter, sorry, Jude verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and here's the line, keep yourself in the love of God. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Keep yourself. That would imply that there are, there are choices that we are making in our lives which affect how and where and whether we enjoy the love of God. It's not that God's love changes... The power is there. What's happened is we've pulled the plug out. Keep plugged in. And the energy will keep flowing. Keep plugged in. And the power of his grace shall un will uphold us and equip us. Paul tells the Ephesians he's praying for them. 
that they might be filled with the love of God. Ephesians 3.17, he's praying that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which (coughs) passes knowledge. (coughs) that you may be filled with the fullness of God. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. We should be praying for each other like this. Oh, that my brothers and sisters were so full of the love of Christ that we were all overflowing like this. It's not that you set yourself up as judge, you know, fine well from yourself that this is our great need. I need the the, the word of God. I need it to dwell in me richly. I need it to speak to my heart and soul. So when the enemy challenges me, when life gets so complicated, I can step back and just remember. As the father loved the son, he loves me. And that love is a holy, perfect love which never changes. I'm going to come and abide in it. Again, Romans 8 helps us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? There'll be some of that. Shall distress? It's going to happen. Or persecution? Well, who knows what the future holds. Many Christians are pessimistic about our land, are they not? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or salt? Or or the sword? No, Paul goes on to say he's fully convinced. And you know the list, I've read it already. That nothing is able to separate us. Nothing is able to separate you. Nothing is able to separate me. Nothing. From the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That dear friend is the reason that we are Christians. It's the reason that we love God. John says so. We love him because he first loved us. We find out about his love not only in his wonderful teachings but especially in his great work at the cross. Within 24 hours they'll take this man and they'll treat him like a common criminal. They'll break the law to kill him. The people that he healed and helped will cry out for his crucifixion. The Romans will have a fun day beating up another mad Jew. And then they'll hoist them up between heaven and earth and laugh at them. Here in his love, vast as an ocean, loving kindness as the sea. Those hymns are really powerful, aren't they? That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, should love me and go to such levels for me. I want to get the rest of that verse. It's not coming to my mind. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, Shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember. Who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten. Through. Through heaven's (coughs) eternal days. Interesting he says heaven's eternal days. Because truth is we do forget it. And sometimes it's not deliberate. It's just busyness. It's It's just the way we live. You and I need to come back here. And put up, put down roots, not put up roots. Set up camp in the love of God. Talk to each other about the love of God. Remind each other. There might be a brother or sister today who's going through a a really hard time. And what they need to do is they need to be reminded of the love of Christ. Not as a sort of a platitude that says, there, there, it's not as bad. But as as a real expression of your own emotion and kindness towards them. It really is a challenge. But it's our life's work. When I was about 14, we moved house. We moved from a village to the local town, and it was a good move. It was for our advantage, a bigger house, more facilities, all sorts of things. But once we had moved house, I never went back to the old one. It was a closed door to me. And I lived somewhere else. Once you become a Christian, you see, you, you've set up home somewhere else, and that's where you have to be. When, when I got married, we, we, we moved out of our parents' houses and set up home ourselves. And we've been living together now for 40-odd years. <coughs> it's nice to visit the parents. Well, it was when they were around. 
but I'll never think of going back there to stay because that's the past, that's who I was. I am now a child of God, I'm part of God's household. Like Joshua of old, we need to make it our statement of faith that we are going to make this the principle of our lives. Joshua 24, 15. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He loved me. He gave himself for me. I'm going to live in that. That's the principle of abiding, which is to undergird our existence. Jesus Christ's love is the refuge, the dwelling place of the child of God. It's the only safe shelter in the storms of life. He is the rock. You and I might wobble on him, but he'll never wobble under us. He is the sure, strong anchor for the soul. You remember that hymn? Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchors drift or firm remain? It's the chorus I want to get to. We have an anchor that keeps the soul. Steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move. And it's this last line which has got my attention. Grounded, firm and deep in the Saviour's love. You know, this studying this has opened up the hymn book in a, a fresh way to me. You, I, I almost defy you to, to look at a hymn that you love and, and, and not to find something about God's love in it. It might just be the exception, so I need to be careful. But most of our hymns take us back to, to, to revel and to relish the love of God. And that's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. For the non-Christian from the outside, what they're doing is they're observing religion. They're seeing practices, they're seeing habits. What they can't see is the heart. And so we say to the non-Christian, what you need, dear friend, is a change in your own heart so that you'll see what we see. So that you'll know who we know. So that you'll have this confidence and hope which God has given to us. Why should God take me to heaven? Is there anything special about me? Humanly speaking, no. In fact... I don't deserve to be there. Why are you going then? Because he loved me. Because he set his love upon me. He sent his son into the world to save me. And his son came because he loved me. And he died because he loved me. And having died, he has now become the source and foundation. If I'm going to boast about anything, says the Apostle Paul, I'm going to boast about Christ. He loved me. And then in verse 10 he goes on to show us how this is very practical. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. It's a fabulous picture, isn't it, of Christ abiding in the Father's love. And setting for us a pattern and a model of instruction to live our lives. If we're going to enjoy Christ's love, if we're going to enjoy being loved and then it comes down to this live as somebody who is loved now, I, I, I find the analogy of being married quite useful because it, it, it demonstrates to us how meeting somebody that loves you and that you love changes you I don't know what you were like as a young man or young woman but I was a bit scruffy She's done wonderful things to me. Didn't it, it was significant. She worked in the, the shirt department of CNAs in Edinburgh. She was an expert in shirts. And I soon began to wear tidy shirts and look a bit smarter, you see. What was happening, she wasn't pressurising me. She was caring for me. She wanted me. And I, I recognised that. Can, can I just extrapolate that and say, dear friends, that's how simple this verse is. If you love me, it said in chapter 14, keep my commandments. This is the man that loves me. Or sorry, the man who keeps my commandments is the man who loves me. It, it just goes round and round. There's no end to this. It's the beginning and the end. It's how Jesus lived. Just as I kept my father's commandments every day of his life. This is the second person of the Trinity. And yet he is pleased for the sake of us 
to humble himself, take the form of a cross, lay aside his rights to worship as deity, and to bear our penalty. My food is to do the will of God and to finish his work. You remember, that's what happened when the disciples came back after the Saviour had been speaking to the woman at the well in chapter 4. My food, they thought he would be starving. They thought he would be thirsty. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Chapter 8, verse 29. He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Can you see this? The Father has not left me alone. I'm continually aware of his presence. I'm continually aware of being loved. For I always do those things that please him. It surely it points to us that when we rebel, that when we allow sin into our life, it's not just that we've done something wrong. We've broken off the rapport and fellowship which is our life, <coughs> the death of Christ. We've broken off the privilege of being loved. The Saviour shows this to the very end of his days when he's faced with the most difficult choice in the world and we see his humanity with all its reality just a few hours after this chapter we are studying he's in the garden he's sweating drops of blood and he's saying father if it's your will take this cup away from me it wasn't as if he could just do it without struggling with it he, he had to wrestle with it nevertheless not my will it's a choice but yours be done we will never know that kind of strain because his was unique but we will find that we need to make choices and that our choices should be to keep his commandments and to keep his commandments because that's the point at which we know and experience and enjoy the fullness of his presence one of my books says love is as it were the sap which passes back and forth between the vine and branch. And that love is kept active and vital by the most practical of means, obedience to his commandments. A means which the Lord himself does not hesitate to describe as efficient between himself and the Father. We really need to sit up and evaluate our Christianity because we do tend to slip back into a legalism where we're doing what we're doing because we have to do it. I found a, a refreshing liking for D.L. Moody in the last year. I've been reading some of his books. I don't always agree with his theology, but his, 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 his personal relationship with Christ is beautiful. And he writes in one of them, I'm getting sick and tired of hearing the word duty, duty, duty. You hear so many talk about it being their duty to do this and to do that. My experience is that such Christians have very little success. Is there not a much higher platform than that of mere duty? Can we not engage in the service of Christ because we love him? Paul confirms that that's the case. For the love of Christ compels us, 2 Corinthians 5.14. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all die. That, that word compels is, 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 is a challenging one, is it not? If I took hold of you today and forced you to do something for me, you'd be screaming and kicking. You'd be saying, what right have you got to do this? Who do you think you are? We're all getting better and better at protesting in society, are we not? We're all standing up for our rights. But here, dear friend, Paul is unabashed. He, he introduces this phrase into the sentence in 2 Corinthians 5, that the love of Christ compels, constrains, is another translation. It comes to us and it drives us. Go back to your family relationship. I hope it's a good one. And when it is good, there are things that you do because you know you're loved. And because you know you love. As gents learn very early on, don't we? I can only speak as a man. And some of you ladies can help me later. We learn very early on the importance of birthday cards. The importance of Valentine's cards. And the benefits. 
It makes a whole different world, doesn't it? Hopefully somewhere you move from knowing the, bit, the, the importance of wanting to do it. Of thinking ahead and saying, oh, that's an opportunity. Can I suggest to you that, that my <coughs> poor analogy is, is, is an attempt to get a picture of what it means to be a Christian. When you know that God loves you, you're saying to yourself, what can I do next? How else can I get this business going? 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Are not burdensome. It's not something, oh no, I have to go to church. I have to go to the prayer meeting. I have to, and I don't want to put things in there that are too personal. You can add your whole range of things. Can you use that phrase, have to? I want to. God is at work in me, both to will and to do, according to his good pleasure. I'm not pretending that I'm on some higher plateau. When I say as I want to, I'm saying that's how we should think. I'm like you, a man of flesh and bone, and I need to wrestle with the reality of it. I need to wrestle with this verse. I need to, to, to get it into my mind. There's a little statement from Augustine, and it capsulates it. He says, love God and do what you please. That could be doing with being on our mantelpieces, could it not? Love God and do what you please, because what you're pleased to do is to love him. What are Jesus' commandments? The first one is to abide in him. That fits right in the context here, doesn't it? Get on your knees before God and say, Lord, you need to keep me here. Because if it's left to me, I'll find something to draw me away. You need to stir my heart and affections with your love. When Jesus began his ministry, he gave the command to unbelievers, repent and believe the gospel. If you're a Christian, you heard that somewhere and you've believed, you've begun. But he went on to tell us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. You see, he intends for us to be visible representatives of what it means to be loved by God. And in that sense, to be attractive. In Matthew 6, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What I'm doing is I'm showing you that the Gospels and the New Testament are full of instruction from Jesus. And in this privilege of being a child of God where I've been sanctified by grace, I'm now called into this, 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 this plan of being, of being separated and set apart for God's glory so that God's glory grows and blossoms in me. And his commandments are not burdensome. The doctrine here laid down is one of the great principles of experimental Christianity, says J.C. Ryle. Holy living and assurance of an interest in Christ are closely connected. Our own happiness and enjoyment of religion are inseparably bound up with our daily practical living. He that expects assurance while he neglects Christ's commandments and gives way to daily inconsistencies of temper and conduct is expecting what he will never get what she will never get these verses are vitally important my prayer is that you go home today meditating on these verses and you'll be confessing your sin you'll be calling on Christ to make them a reality in your life because that's what it means to practice abiding a policeman I read found a little boy going round and round the block on his bicycle and he was obviously frustrated in doing so. And so the policeman stopped him and said, What are you doing, son? Why are you going round and round the block like this? He says, Because I can't cross the road. And he says, Why? Because my mother told me I mustn't cross the street because that will take me away from her. The mother's command was keeping the boy close to her. The Saviour's command is designed to keep us close to him, to, to express to us the importance of being close, of staying close. If, like me, you're now asking, how on earth did I become so sluggish 
I used to love these things you might be saying when I was a young Christian you couldn't stop me it's you that's changed not the gospel and what we need is some old Christians who are on fire for the Lord again the the increase in the older population and an unbelieving older population really is an awesome task for us to (coughs) evangelise Lord set me on fire and set me on fire by by stirring me with your love and drawing me out after your grace and for your glory. I'll finish by reminding you we've been talking about abiding in God's love and then reading these words from Max Lucado. God wants to be your dwelling place. He has no interest in being a weekend getaway or a Sunday bungalow or a summer cottage. Don't consider using God as a holiday cottage or an eventual retirement home. He wants you under his roof now and always. He wants to be your mailing address, your point of reference. He wants to be your home. Amen.